about, I promise you. And first of all, thank you all so much for coming to the second annual Her Universe panel at San Diego Comic Con. We just launched our company, Her Universe, last year at San Diego Comic Con, and I cannot thank you enough for your support. And this year, our panel is titled What Women Want in Their Female Sci Fi Heroes. We started with Star Wars and now debuting at Comic Con. We have our sci fi channel live. We have Battlestar Galactica, Where Comic Con. Let's not forget his and her Sharky Pusher. <laughs>
And, and again, um, when Dave gets here, I, I can't wait for you guys to listen to him because I was really inspired by what he's doing. For those of you who don't know, I do the voice of Ahsoka Tano on Star Wars and Clone Wars. And I really Woo! feel that, thank you, I really feel that they, they're doing great things with the female characters on that show as well. So let's dive right in with Chris. Um, Chris, when we chatted, uh, I want to ask you, what are you, uh, when you're in development for a television series, is there a difference in the way you develop male and female characters, or is it the same, and why? Uh, well, first I want to say thank you to you and to her universe, because I think by um, looking at this room, you can tell that what you're doing is really needed. And um, as a female fan myself, I'm really excited and wish you the best of luck, because her universe is something that fills a gap that I think we are all eager to um, go buy our t-shirts, turn around. Yes, everybody has to see our new Battlestar Galactica shirt. It has the red And our toaster necklace. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so thank you. Thank you. But I thank all of you out there because uh, all the girls are speaking up. And yeah. they, can't, they can't ignore us if we speak up, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, for TV development at least, um, you know, the thing that I love most about television is you're inviting characters to come into your house. It's a very intimate experience, I think. When you're watching television, you're at home, you're inviting these characters to come back over and over again in series TV. And so the goal is to create characters that are relatable and people that you want to see on a week-to-week -week basis. You want to, these people become your friends. I think it's one of the reasons that people feel so comfortable with television actors and television stars. Um, and I think the, the approach to the development of female and male characters, at least where we work, is really about making accessible characters. I don't think we really start from a place of gender necessarily, but we definitely start from a place of making sure that these are characters that are relatable. I think some of the most memorable characters that we've developed um, at our company are female characters in part because of the complexity um, that our writers and our creators have really approached the development of many of our characters with. But uh, one of the most recent experiences that I've had um, that I thought was applicable to today's panel was uh, we were developing a project called Battlestar Galactica Blood and Chrome. Oh. It's really awesome. <laughs> and um, David Ike and I were on the phone and I was driving in my car and talking on my cell phone. We were talking about this um, character who's, you know, an admiral and the ship's going down and the ship blowing up and who am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> So stuff's yeah. blowing up. Maybe under the age of 18. Oh, yeah. stuff is blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about this moment, and I said, have you ever thought about making the Admiral a woman? Why? What I love about the original Battlestar, well, not the original 70s Battlestar, but because I was too young to watch that show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I love about Ron Moore's reimagining the Battlestar was that um, there was uh, no gender politics, and it was very, you know, there was a lot of sexual equality. And um, it, it actually changed the scene. He's, he actually, David Icke was like, I hate when you say something that I wish I thought of first. And it was a wonderful moment because it actually changed the tenor of the scene when the commander of that particular um, Battlestar was a woman and she had to, like, give the command to, well, I don't, you know, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> um, to her, her to, know what happens. to her, you know, lieutenant, and it was just a, a really powerful moment. But I think because we made her a woman and we didn't approach it with any sense of, I mean, we didn't change the dialogue at all, we just changed the gender of the character. Uh, it became a much more interesting scene, to be honest. That's fantastic. And I have to say, I'm a huge Battlestar Galactica fan, and I loved it. The fact that Katie Sackhoff Starbuck was amazing. So, awesome. Yes. And actually, Dave Filoni just walked in. So, Dave, you didn't hear your applause before.
All right, well, we had a great chat. And actually, it's funny because similar to what Chris said, um, my question for you is very similar. And uh, you know, the question I have is, during our chat, we discussed your approach to writing a female character. And you told me that you look beyond gender and just try to write an accessible character with relatable flaws. Explain your process. And I think the word relatable uh, is interesting because that's what Chris said. And it kind of goes beyond gender. Well, it, it definitely doesn't exclude anyone when you're writing a character, especially if there's, regardless of how bizarre a situation is, if you can buy into the person who's going through that situation or the people who are going through that situation, you're along for the ride. And whether it's uh, people trapped on an island, and there's mysterious things happening in the background. <laughs> um, if you believe in those people, then you'll go along with the smoke monster, for a period of time, at least. <laughs> um, it helps to make them human. And I think, specifically with female characters, there can be a notion that they need to be um, very kind of tough and hard and cold. And I mean, especially to the to the Starbuck point, too. Like, she was very flawed as well, but also very vulnerable. It, is, it wasn't just a flaw based on, oh, and she drinks a lot. There, there, was, there, was more, there was more to it than that. And I think if but you can... Does. Well, she does. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to start by apologies. <laughs> um, but if you can find ways in those characters, whether they're male or female, to give that person a vulnerability that isn't necessarily even a negative vulnerability, if it's, uh, like, when, when I wrote Batgirl, the biggest flaw, uh, and also her biggest strength was enthusiasm. And it's certainly something not expected in a character in a very situous situation. Serious situation. Um, and I think it gives some texture and gives you something to hold on to as you're following that character through whatever adventure they're on. So I definitely say happy flaws as well as as well as dark flaws are a big plus in helping bring anybody from any background into whether it's science fiction or mystery or crime, whatever it is, it's a way to bring everyone in. Now what about the preconceived notion that a pink butt heroine has to either be a robot or a sex bot? <laughs> <laughs> they, they do exist. <laughs> I'm not a fake apologist either, but um, if, if you look at Buffy, for example, off of, off of the fake thing, she kicked butt, but she also ha had very human, I mean, emotion. She was very not robotic, even though there was a Buffy bot at one point. But <laughs> she, she would cry, even like Alias. If you look at Alias, like Sydney very much wanted a happy family with, with her father and wanted to make uh, kind of with Vaughn what she never had growing up. Because to the relatable point, it, it may are too. Um, <laughs> to the relatable point, it, it helps you go along for the ride. Yes. Awesome. Well, round of applause for Brian Huber. <laughs> Next we have Betsy Mitchell. 30 years is a long time to have been in sci fi fantasy field. Have you seen some changes as far as women's contributions to book publishing over that time? Absolutely. We're kind of in a golden age right now of uh, women reading science fiction and fantasy. There are more women reading now than there ever have been in my entire lifetime. And that can be tied directly to the fact that 30 years ago, there were not that many women writers. It's, it's a complete conjunction there. As soon as women writers started getting into the field and the women, followed, the women readers followed behind them. In the old days, women, if they were writing in the field, kind of had to sneak in through the back door by using initials in their name, like C.L. Moore or Andre Norton, who was one of the most beloved writers of all time. You know, that sounds like a guy's name. And uh, that was the only way some women could get published up to a certain time. And then female editors started coming into the field. I have to say that editors as well were a huge influence on bringing more female writers in. Some of it started happening during the feminist era, the 60s and 70s, when you had Ursula Le Guin and uh, Joanna Russ starting to write. And then in the 80s, a whole new slew of women came in. And they wrote a social, kind of a, social science fiction. It wasn't the hard science fiction. It wasn't taking spaceships to a far distant planet and conquering it, which was what a lot of the previous science fiction had been. This was examining different societies, maybe by means of, of alien planets. Uh, there were a lot of utopian stories being told, um, authors like Sherry Tepper, um, just women experimenting with what would happen if 
you know, there was a planet all, of all women. You know, something had happened to the men, or the men and the women had been separated. What would life be like then if women had to make all the decisions? Would we still have wars? Uh, so, that type of science fiction started growing in the 80s, uh, and then more young women came in. It's just been a whole different scene. Um, women talking about sex from their own point of view, you know? It's a whole different story <laughs> when you're reading it from a, a female writer's point of view. So we really are in a, in a fabulous time. You, you can't imagine how different life was just 30 years ago. We also talked about that many of today's top-selling book series fall under the urban paranormal genre. Mm -hmm. Now, aren't women both the main producers and the main audience for that category? Absolutely, and that can be uh, key, I think, to Buffy. Buffy's really what kicked up that whole urban paranormal genre. Um, and some of you were talking about sex bots or robots. <laughs> yeah, that's, but there's such a range of urban paranormal now, from the, the very sexy stuff like Laurel K. Hamilton to the Kim Harrison Hollows series, where the two characters, the main characters are female, and it's the tension in their relationship, the living vampire and the earth witch and it's the tension between the two of them, some of which is sexual. Um, so you get that whole stripe of urban paranormal, but yeah, that has been such a huge contributor to the coffers of publishing in the last 10 years or so. Round of applause for Betsy Mitchell. Next we have Gail Simone, and uh, Gail, do you feel that the portrayal of women in comics has improved, and what do you think they could be doing better to attract more people? Um, well, first of all, there's a couple things. I do think it's improved. <laughs> Even what I'm so excited about today, and I get more excited every year, is when I first started coming to conventions about seven, eight years ago, uh, the first convention I ever attended was San Diego Comic Con. I just started writing at Marvel. I think I only had one or two books out. I'd done some Simpsons stuff. And um, there was not nearly as many women attending the convention then as there is now. And I've watched it every year get a, a larger and larger percentage, and not just like being dragged here by their husbands and boyfriends anymore. They're dragging husbands and boyfriends with them, or coming with a group of their girlfriends, or coming by themselves. Even it's it's very exciting. They have a loud voice. The internet has really, I think, helped even the playing field in comics because we have so many great uh, female commentators on comics and podcasters and and things like that as well. And so the comics industry was kind of slow to admit that there was a female audience. And um, back when I put up the Women in Refrigerator site, my, that was my response. For those of you who don't know, it was a website that was my response to people all asking me all the time, well, why don't women read comics? And at the time, we had come through this period where the female characters were really being murdered, depowered, stuffed in refrigerators, um, used only as plot tools for the male characters, and then they're, and the industry's up in arms, why don't we have female readers? So that website was my response to that. And we have come, I mean, we were kind of coming out of that at the time anyway, we were getting a lot of great writers, uh, Greg Rucka, and you know, I could list on and on about um, writers who were helping improve that. And, um, Still, I thought it was kind of a problem because, you know, what, what, what would the, the whole male audience do if Batman and Superman all of a sudden were chopped up and stuffed in a refrigerator and nobody, you know, and that was the end of them. Seemed crazy to me. So, um, yes, we are improving. And because of that, audience is responding really well, which I'm very excited about. We're getting a larger audience who are speaking out what they like and don't like and, and contributing whether it's as a creator or a commentator or whatever, and it's making a huge, huge difference. So thank you all for, do, for doing that and being part of it. Um, and I, in fact, even I was just at this convention, I think like two months ago, and I was sitting at my table signing and there was um, people in line and I was in a row of, you know, both sides had long tables and there was artists and creators, you know, talking to readers and fans. and, and this, one guy was talking to my husband kind of off to the side and he was saying, you know, women don't read comics. And there was like 12 women in line at my table. All the way down the road there was women waiting for sketches of comic book characters from these terrific artists that were there. And I was like, 
why do we still have somebody who's looking right at <laughs> this huge female audience in this tiny little area of the convention and still saying that? I don't even understand how that happens. Those days are gone. We don't have that anymore. Um, and for me, as far as the future goes, I think I'm sure there's going to be a certain percentage of you in the audience today that are going to become creators or contributing contributors in one way or another. And I encourage you, whether you're female or male, to bring your principles with you, stick to them. Female characters put on a pedestal to represent all womankind are boring. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they're boring. And not all women are the same. We don't all like the same things. We don't do the same things. So our characters should not be that. They also shouldn't be male characters with boobs and, and long hair. You know, they need to be fully rounded. They need to have their own motivations. They need to exist other than just for the male characters. They need to be more than just someone's girlfriend. They need to have their own motivations and their own reasons for being in that story, not just as a sidekick all the time. Lots of variety, lots of ethnicities, people with disabilities, people with different sexual orientations, all of it. We need, you know, the world is not like it was in the 1930s. nothing else to do. That's what I mean by bringing your principles with you. Don't leave your principles behind when you come into the industry. And you know, one thing I have to say, uh, kind of to what you were saying, how people are ignoring that the women uh, want the merchandise or that the women, they just ignore them. Uh, we just sold little girl shirts for the first time. And I remember I went into the store and there was things full of little girl Asoka fans and there was absolutely nothing for them. And everyone said, oh, no, they won't buy it. The girls, they will not buy it. And so for the first time, we just offered little girl shirts at Disney, and they all sold out right away, and they were begging us for more. And I have to say, as adults here, how many of us, when we were little girls, were probably ashamed of the fact that we liked sci-fi because of that stereotype that it was for boys? And we weren't as confident to come out and say that we liked sci-fi. And now, I think many of us, as adults, uh, we're more confident in it, and now there's tons of little girl fans, and I think people, Gail, actually, all of you up on this panel, you're, you're such positive influences on all the little girls that are sci-fi fans that are going to have an easier time because of the road that you're paving. So, congratulations to everyone up here. I think it's neat, too. I mean to have the choice of products that are built for women <laughs> that obviously have a female shape or you know things that we like as well. And uh, so thanks to you for doing that. Thank you. There well, was well, we're trying, we're trying. Because shirts do uh, come other sizes besides tween sizes. <laughs> so we're trying to get them out. Uh, Do you remember hearing recently about the little girl who was bullied at school for being a Star Wars fan? Yes. We were able to get one of our female Star Wars writers to send her an autographed book and say, you go girl, and we just did everything we could to help support her, because little girls are still going through it. Exactly, and I think what made everyone respond to that story is because we all related to it. So um, I think that's why that story just went viral. Well, not only that, I remember as a little girl, I loved Batgirl and Catwoman and stuff, but I wanted to role play Batman because his character was so well drawn, so fully developed compared to the other characters that that appealed to me. And so when I started writing some of the female characters in the Bat verse, it was kind of like, I would like a young girl to want to be Black Canary or be Batgirl or one of those characters and not just think that Batman was the only really cool one. Well, it's funny, because this leads us right into my conversation with Melinda. And Melinda, we chatted about how you were a little girl growing up in Maine, and you felt different, and you were shy. And, you know, um, that leads me to my question, because as a little girl growing up in Maine, you told me you were big in the sci-fi and fantasy genre, watching Star Trek, and reading the Dragon Riders of her novels. And you said that you were drawn to the fact that in these stories, being different was celebrated. 
So, uh, you know, we also talked about some of your favorite female sci-fi characters, past and present. So, talk to us about your experiences and some of your favorite female characters. Well, I did kind of hide in my bedroom all through childhood because I grew up in Bangor, Maine, which is a very small town, and everybody was great to me, but I was very timid. And I was one of the only non-white people in the state at that time. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally, I think that the population of minorities dipped when I left the state. And so I was kind of constantly reading the Lord of the Rings over and over, or Star Trek books, and I was writing Star Trek fan fiction as a little kid, and I was like going up to the Enterprise and visiting planets, and you know, I, I had this kind of escapist desire. But it's also something that I really felt like, oh, why would you in space? I would be bringing something to the party, you know? Or it didn't feel like that way at my school. And I think that that's why I gravitated to those sorts of stories. And, and I love science fiction and fantasy anyway, because I love those stories. But I'm also still attracted to that sort of thing now, whether I'm writing for a post-apocalyptic show or whether the current show I'm on is more about interconnectivity all over the world. It's a kind of like this It's Wonderful Life vibe where you don't think that your little choices make a difference, but they actually have a huge impact on somebody you've never even met. And it's a cool show. Anyway. But the point is that I love those sorts of things they make it feel like I could be better than I thought I could be. I could rise above. I could make a difference in somebody's life. I could be a hero myself, you know? I can also encourage any young women writers out there to keep writing and to feel like I could, you know, get to publish someday or somebody would want to read this story or that, you know, like it's on the internet and somebody would respond. I think one thing you have these days instead of, you know, the isolation of your childhood bedroom is the internet, which is awesome. You know, you can go on YouTube and watch these things and you can and you can chat and you can comment and tweet and in fact just learning about all this stuff is very exciting. <laughs> so it's kind of like it's a way to reach out to other people and feel like because there are all these other people who like the same things that you do. It's so cool to go, for instance, we were at Lego Land the other day and they made this mini land out of different vistas of there's like hot and there's Tatooine and there's this little um you know, there's an AT-AT at that, those big things, and Luke Skywalker was dangling off, it's like this big, you know, he's a leg up, he's hanging on a little string, and some kid goes by in a stroller, in Spanish, I need a salute, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Team um, throughout, and I think I learned a lot from them. 
when George brought up the idea of having you have a nickname, Snips, I was really resistant to that whole concept, I have to say. And so the practice is I started calling her my sister Snips. And I would see whether she liked that or not. And I would get kind of the way that she would punch back and make the dialogue. And I would put that into the show, actually, the way they experiment with it. But, you know, I just, it never occurs to me, Luminara is a Jedi Knight. She's incredibly wise. She's a woman, you know. Some of them are quite attractive. But that doesn't ever factor into it for me. I just, they have real problems. They're fighting the war. They have the same issues that any general would have with their soldiers. So I, I try to go about it from there. And I also say my white man is a really great springboard for any ideas I have in there. Um, you know, she's, she's very well read, far more than I am. Um, so, but like you, I, I think Eowyn, I have to say, was a huge, huge thing for me as a kid. I remember reading the Trinity thing when I got to that point where she slays the Witch King. I remember rereading that page because I was so shocked as a little boy. Because I was like, really, the witch king? <laughs> and I think, looking back, I think it's sad that that was my reaction in a way, but it made me reread it. And it made me think about why is that? And here you have a character, it doesn't matter, she's female, and, but the cause of that she's been judged by her peers that she's in this kind of caging. So she's so rarely accepting of death that when she faces death there before her, and everyone else is she is afraid to lose their life, she's not. And like the other panelists were saying, that's a real dilemma. It doesn't matter that she's a girl. But the funniest thing about the scene is that when the witch king says, no living man may hinder me, and she's there, she's like, ha, well guess what? <laughs> and she takes her helmet off, and her hair spills out. I mean, that, that's a really inspirational scene, and she's an incredibly inspirational character, so... Um, yeah, I think that that probably affected me. You know, I, I hope I do right. I think I've, I've done right by your character. I like to think so. The same amount of thought we give to anything, I mean, it's not that different. Well, I, one thing I've noticed is that, especially with the toys, because I've heard over and over again that little, uh, little boys will not buy female action figures. And I have to say, we've gone past that because now, I've met so many little boys that have to have the Ahsoka action figure because they look past her gender. She's no longer a girl Padawan. She's just Anakin's Padawan. They don't see the fact that she's a girl. And that truly is a testament to how you've written the female characters. You, somehow you, you bypass gender. And it's not just with Ahsoka. You've done that with many of the characters. You forget about it. They're just such strong characters. Well, I think the kids just want to relate to her being trained. You know, they see Ahsoka going through this. They just, kids like to see other kids experience things, be challenged by things. And when Henry Bjorn and I started the series, we decided we wanted to add another Jedi. We decided immediately that it was gonna be a girl, just because we'd seen Luke, okay? Luke did his thing, and then I saw Anakin, and he did his thing. What about all the other Jedi, the female Jedi, the Shaktis, Luminara, Adam Galia? you know, Barris off it. Well, what's going on there? Why not have a kid and see how they handle it? And um, I think she's, she's, she's my favorite character, as I've told you, and uh, I really like writing her in her story, and everybody else is concerned on whether we're gonna kill her or not. And I think <laughs> any concern over whether a character's gonna live or not, and people care that much to say, please don't do it, I guess we've done okay, so we'll see. <laughs> when you agreed to be on our panel because Claudia is one, I feel, one of the most popular female characters on television today, and you got a huge part of that. So, you know, explain to us your process in making Claudia come to life. I will with pleasure, but I first just want to thank you so, so much for inviting me to be part of this. It's, it's such an honor to be uh, here on this panel and listening to these insightful speakers. They yeah, always get emotional when I was hearing you talk about it, you know. <laughs> the kind of women we need to see on screen. Um, and, and I really lucked out with this role. Um, Claudia is, a role like that is really hard to come by for actresses my age. This is a sexist industry we work in. Cards on the table, I have lost roles based on my bra size. Um, uh, me too. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a serious play, so, um, you know, being able to play uh, a smart, strong, skillful, but also vulnerable and fast.
Babel layered character is really a common among these legions of overtly sexual, two-dimensional, just kind of useless hot girl roles. Um, and, I, and I think that's also one of the things that sets our show apart is um, this ensemble of strong women that are integral to the storytelling of Warehouse 13. In fact, before I even joined the cast, um, I was encouraged to watch the pilot at the behest of our show around Jack Henny to see if, number one, it was even something I was interested in being involved with. And I fell in love with it immediately. Uh, my favorite was initially my favorite character. Um, and then also it was Frederick and Lena and later H.G. Wells. Um, they're, they're all strong and smart and they bring something different and something crucial to the show. And so beyond the, you know, the amazing work that our writers do, it's up to me to um, be honest with myself and never lie to the character and never lie, never lie to you guys, never lie to the audience. I'll give you an example. Um, at the beginning of filming season three, this is past February, for whatever reason, I was so nervous. I, I was a wreck. I was having like heart palpitations before filming and just overwhelmed by the props and the dialogue and all of it. And, and I went to Saul. Ruben Eck, who plays already, who has been a uh, mentor to me uh, from day one. And I told him how I was feeling, and, and he was like, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you're, you're kind of scared, you feel you need to prove yourself to uh, the authorities and exterior writer. I was like, well, yeah. He said, so how is that any different from what Claudia's going for? <laughs> and I kind of blushed because I saw this such a way of putting things so simply. And I think that was the best piece of advice that um, I've received all year. So, so, so now, when I um, approach a day on the warehouse, I, I just show up. And if I'm feeling um, angry or curious or ambitious or excited or confused, um, I let that breathe within Claudia. Because for me, um, the thing that makes a character relatable, really, this, this theme that we've been talking about is um, how realistic they are. I, like, to, I, when I watch Walking Dead or Game of Thrones, um, and I recognize a quality um, in Ari Stark that I recognize in myself or a friend, um, that's what makes me connect. It's an honor, and I have so, so much fun doing it, and our, our, um, our diverse writing staff really just listens to us as a cast and, um, and me as a budding feminist. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, I hope that um, roles like Claudia and Micah and Artist Star and uh, all these amazing, well-rounded chicks continue to uh, crop up in, in successful and also under-the-radar projects. I've, I've gotten um, a lot of really amazing feedback from young women that brings tears to my eyes every time I read it. Um, because I was that insecure, you know, kind of offbeat alternative girl in school who liked Star Wars and, you know, oldies radio. <laughs> um, <laughs> <too>. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I, know, I have to say one thing that I love about Claudia is just how intelligent she is. You are proving to young girls that it is so cool to be the smartest one in the room. And I have young nieces and nephews, and one of my nieces is in, actually going into high school, and she's in the math club. And actually, uh, my sister-in-law's in the audience. She she just taught uh, like third place, and she she got a really high score. And I'm a bad aunt right now because I can't remember what place she came in. But um, it's it's the fact she's a really smart young girl. And in the past, sometimes you hide your intelligence. As a girl, I mean, trust me, I've played many ditzy blonde roles in the past where that was cool. It was cool to just play dumb and be in your head. And Claudia is such a role model to young girls where you are saying, it is so cool. Something's broken, I can fix it. And I think so many young girls are looking up to you because of that. And your portrayal is just fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege. <laughs> a uh, conversation I had with Chris and Augustine, but uh, since we have comic books up here, novels, uh, TV, animation, um, is the iconography of women in sci-fi approached differently in a live action series versus an animated series or in comics? Uh, and 
Let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> um, I'll start with one. Just uh, so we all know that sex sells. Um, and one of the things that I found really fun in this year's Warehouse 13 is six. Is it episode six? Yes. Play it. We actually make fun of the iconography of women in video games. In video games. <laughs> so that's not one that you listed, but we're all genre fans, and so there are gotta be gamers in this audience, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and y'all like big boobs, apparently. <laughs> no so, gravity in video games. <laughs> Unless they're bouncing. <laughs> and there's the girl size again. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what's really interesting about it, I was, in listening to all these conversations, I found it fascinating that within Warehouse 13, we have H.G. Wells dealing with a woman who's posing as a man who was an author in the 1800s. And uh, so that kind of strikes a chord with something that um, was said earlier. And then we do play with the iconography, I think. Um, not only a player, but I think also in HG's adaptation um, because she's a woman not only out of her own time, but who's really had to deal with being of a gender who uh, was quite, you know, suppressed uh, in the turn of the century. So um, I think we've really explored that a lot in, in that series in particular. Don't sell yourself short because you're also hot. <laughs> <laughs> Smart is hot too, and <laughs> <laughs> that counts twice because I'm a lesbian, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>
lot of buddy boy books, but not so much girl books. Well, thank you for writing it, because I feel like that took longer than reading it. Hi, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sci-fi writer, and I've heard two sentiments that I've had some trouble reconciling. One was what Gail was saying about uh, the best female characters aren't just men with boobs, but then like Gail was saying, it's, it's best to write female characters that uh, you're just looking at people and you're not uh, writing some special woman that is that's different than a man. And I, I don't really understand how those two can fit together, but I've heard them from a lot of different perspectives, so I was wondering if you could help me reconcile it better. What I meant, women can like the same things and want to do the same things that are typically in the past known you know, as male careers, jobs, interests, whatever. I wasn't saying that they shouldn't do that because I do think that they should if that is true to their character and honest to their character and stuff. What I don't like is the female characters that are just like, you know, male superhero number 20. They talk the same, they are motivated by the same things. You're just seeing the exact same character dressed up on the outside. That's what I'm referring to. And, um, I think people should do what they're interested in, what they want to do, and what they're willing to work for, whether they're male or male or what it is. It's just, I didn't want, there were so many characters in comics that literally were about as deep as, um, you know, a scratch on a table. It's just, I'm so, I was so tired of those kind of characters. <laughs> I think, you know, to me, I think we're relatively saying the same thing. I just, to be perfectly honest, I, I would gauge you a lot better. I mean, <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. Okay, I, I, you know, the poem... I don't know, your character is successful. I'm trying, I really appreciate that. But my, <coughs> the poem was the first time I ever had to write anything. And it's something I was thrust into this, you know, super you know, property Star Wars where everyone was going to see it and have comments about it. So I've always felt a lot of pressure about that, and you know, <coughs> writing this young girl character, I felt a certain amount of pressure about it. But I know that character, and I like that character, and I just, you know, I don't think I ever related her to things, or she has issues, she, she has problems with them, but they center around her world. So I just tried to have to get into the head of her, you know, in her world, and what are the problems that she would have. Probably it's very similar problems that I would have, but, I wouldn't just, you know, if I made a villain, I wouldn't just dress her up in a female kind of version of Darth Vader and have the same story. Like she would have to be different than me in her own ways. Um, we just created a, a Mandalorian warrior that's a, a woman, which is kind of a first in uh, the kind of theatrical Star Wars uh, releases. And I really wanted to do that. Um, you know, I'll admit, part of my motivation is that a lot of times are girls good. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is for all of you, I guess. Um, I've noticed that a lot of female characters have been criticized and put down for, you know, like dressing in sexy outfits or wearing fishnets or shorts or whatever, and people say that it's objectifying and a bad example. But where do you guys draw the line between empowerment and exploitation? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a thesis now, you have to understand I'm not speaking for all people, all women, or anything like that. I have a pretty high tolerance for what we call cheesecake, if it's honest. I don't like things that are not honest. I don't like things that are just close-up penthouse pose of, you know, any female genitalia or whatever. I like the fully, and I believe that there's all different types of sexy. Different body shapes, different colors, different attitudes, different charisma, glasses, no glasses, black hair, blonde hair, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> but I think, you know, if, if, if you're having, and these are, this is a visual medium, we're all working in a visual medium, we can't deny that fact. But I think that for me, it's honesty, truth to the character, not boiling it down to just body parts. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about whether it's exploitive, whether the character exists only for that, unless that's, you know, part of the story, um, I, is, is a big thing for me too. I'd like them to have more to them than just that, because I don't know that many people, no matter how beautiful they are, that have no depth whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I also think it has to do with how the camera treats them sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of some of the summer movies where 
a very beautiful woman would be in a very tight dress, and that's fine, you know, you've got to work it. But the camera <laughs> would kind of go like this, you know, and the music would slow down. And, and zoom. Oh my God. <laughs> Nothing else would be happening in that moment on the screen, literally. And also, then you have somebody like Christina Hendricks on that, and she's gorgeous and very voluptuous, and she's just doing her thing. And she's, you know, beautifully outfitted and, and very curvy. And part of her, you know, character is that she is this very dynamic female and she kind of uses that on that, but there's nothing about it that to me feels exploitative. It feels like she's of her time and that's an essential part of her character. Well, and her character chose to do that. Yeah, she was she not exploited upon. That's mm -hmm. a big difference for me too. Right. Right. She used, she used uh, yeah, Christina Hendricks' character uses her, um, her sexuality as one of her most powerful qualities. I, you know, we're all sexual creatures in some way, and, and I don't think that we have to uh, deny that side of ourselves in our expression to prove our, our intelligence or anything. But like what you were saying, you know, we're not the sum of our uh, attractive parts. We're not just a pair of, you know, legs and a, and a tiny waist and, you know, long flowing hair. Um, we may have all those things, but there's a, a person in there with abilities and, and problems and a history. And, uh, some, a lot of projects just hang a lantern on the physical aspects of women. I was actually listening to a really hilarious podcast uh, by Paul Shear and Paul Russ, a bunch of funny people, and they were talking about um, this sort of random uh, girl falling out of the, the bed of the superhero in these big movies like Iron Man, and the movie they were reviewing was Green Lantern, which I haven't seen yet. And they both said, I want to see a movie about these girls who are just in Tony Stark's head, and you've never seen it again. You don't know her name. It was just like, oh, that girl that he was sleeping with in the beginning of the movie to establish that he gets what he wants. So yeah, and there has to be a girl. Whatever. Yeah, there has to be a girl that he slept with and dumped in order for him to grow his character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've definitely gotten past the stage in uh, book covers where for a certain period of time there were these completely unrealistic costumes that women were put in, mostly on books written by men. They'd be in these tiny little outfits when they were supposed to be going out to battle, so we call them battle nighties. <laughs> <laughs> but when women started writing the books, they made sure that things were a bit more realistic. When I see a, one of our kick-butt her kick heroines, though, wearing spike heels, I just, I can't understand how she's going to race down the street and then kick butt. <laughs> is that the women actually outnumber the men. And it's not just that there are a few strong female characters like in Battlestar or there's Starbuck, but she's still overwhelmed by a ton of characters. So I'm wondering if there's anything different about making a show where the majority of the characters are Really what I struggle with on, on the show is always trying to keep a, a greater sense of diversity. Um, because I, I feel like our core characters are so well established and as we introduce new people into the warehouse and I think as, as you look at the expanding universe, right, of the warehouse and Mrs. Frederick and Nina and now um, we've got some other characters coming in too, but I, I, I don't think that we necessarily approach it um, with an eye necessarily toward women, but I know that Jack Kenny, who is our showrunner, um, a, writes women very well, has a tremendous amount of respect for women, and um, is, I think, a little bit fascinated by um, the differences in how women carry authority. And I was fascinated and, and thrilled when they chose to make H.G. Wells a woman. Um, and it was a complete twist, and we had to get a couple people to buy in, but I think it was, it was really smart. You're amazing. Thank you for coming with us. I need to do one where I'm not seven feet tall. How about that? You're welcome.